now i call dr db jabra sir our beloved joint registrar a and s to share few words on this national e level ftp good morning to all i'm very happy to be here can you hear me yes sir yes ah okay okay madam yes first uh, i would like to welcome back to the devasi company assistant professor of english lal dr lal lal doctor doctor lal or first is uh, morning morning session like morning lal. session doctor lal yes uh, yes madam thank you madam uh, well, welcome doctor lal sir hi hi sir <laughs> professor of english university of kerala uh, really we are happy to uh, receive your uh, words sir this morning uh, everybody is seeking your uh, uh, good ex- uh, good uh, experience and uh, this program is national program definitely all the faculty members will benefited will be benefited uh, during this uh, crucial period uh, once again welcome our uh, dr sandarshan madam hod of english and other faculty members uh, i am really am appreciating uh, dr sandarshan madam and uh, her team because first time she is conducting this um, ftp program during this uh, crucial period through uh, web- webinar i am really am appreciating i think lot of people are uh, attending more than uh, around 200 people are attending so everybody will be benefited on behalf of dr nchar education research institute we once again welcome you all thank you professor and others thank you sir thank you sir thank you now i call thank you sir our, our head of the department dr chandrasena rajeshwaran ma'am to give a welcome address mm-hmm. a merry good morning to one and all present here i thank our founder chairman the visionary par excellence dr acs ac shanmugam our honorable president engineer acs arun kumar our beloved provost dr g gopalakrishnan our vice chancellor dr geeta lakshmi our registrar dr cb palnevelu joint registrar academic dr siril raj our beloved a joint registered dr jabarraj and our dean dr shubhashree ma'am at the outset we are honored to be here in this august platform to discuss various methods by which we can improve our knowledge okay so i am really happy that we are here to improvise our knowledge to take back certain information that our uh, research person dr CLR has been uh, will be giving us okay i before that i would like to say a certain a few words regarding our present context uh, we are in a context wherein our uh, our ugc has prescribed certain norms uh, for teaching our students our teaching learning process is uh, is defined in terms of locf that is a learner based outcome learner out learner based out uh, locf learner uh, locf that vgc uh, has given is really uh, demanding we have spoken and heard enough of covid-19 and the monster may be overpowered in a few months that is what we hope for till then let us keep safe within our four walls of our house and listen to learned resource persons to improvise our teaching techniques in the post covid times okay teaching is a bit complex considering the jargons like a teacher is no more a teacher but a facilitator monitor coordinator and so on to make classroom learning an engaging and enjoyable activity that is what we are expected to do Uh, and the communication skills of our students should be taken care that they are able to speak and write clearly in standard academic english ability li- ability that they should be able to listen to read carefully various viewpoints and engage them engage with them 
okay this and they are also asked to have the digital literacy the digital literacy itself is not enough they need to have the competence digital competence the ability to use digital resources for gathering information ability to use digital resources for presentations and various really other purposes okay so this is what the expectation is learner should be in, in such a context how are you going to teach the students they should be engaged in rigorous process of learning and they should be self to self discover and they should be all to adapt highly focused approach to learning they should be encouraged to focus on key areas of the course and spend time on learning the course fundamentals and their application in real life and society this is what uh, we talk about their cognition process or they, they should be able to have declarative knowledge as well as be able to process the knowledge for future application in teaching and learning pedagogy uh, they should be they should uh, they should not be trained in a conclusion based approach but to with an approach to experiential process based approach in the faculty should be promoting learning on a proportionate scale that is what they have given the guidelines is only 20% tutorials 30% visual and 50% they should learn to do by practice this is what they expect. this is a kind of learner centered teaching that they insist on the ratio should uh, is uh, maybe it may subject to change to the university's adaptation of the program but however the knowledge that the learners are going to receive from the teachers is that they should be able to use their knowledge what they have gathered inside the college uh, actually to use it outside the uh, college outside the university in the real world life real life for so many other purposes so the for that the language that uh, learning should equip them in such other ways in so many other ways like uh, instructional conversations discussions and role plays and this is what they insist upon to Im improve the communicative skills of the learners as well as to bring teamwork and team spirit in them so we are here to learn to learn from dr p l all how we exactly we are going to reappraise our teaching technique in the esl classes esl classes we know how the students are uh, they are less motivated to learn but we are how we are we going to how are we going to motivate them for a for an effective learning that is what we are going to learn from dr lal today so thank you sir for coming over coming to our uh, screen to give us your valid input for our teachers all over the country and i request now dr harshini ma'am to introduce our resource person dr c l all thank you ma'am a pleasant good morning to one and all connected show it is a privilege for me to introduce the resource person of today an erudite scholar an experienced teacher an enthusiastic learner dr lal c a professor of english school of distance education university of kerala dr lal completed his ug pg and also his doctorate from the university of kerala he has also completed at top online from the university of oregon and tech online from the university of maryland usa he has also cleared the ugc net in the year 1990 his rich teaching experience from 1993 to present has been formerly in christian college katakada and presently in school of distance education university of kerala dr lal has been a master trainer for english language skills in the additional skills acquisition program government of kerala from 2012 to 2016 he has considerable experience in training aspirants for ielts and is also a business english certificate trainer dr lal has been course coordinator for ba and ma english and also for a number of certificate diploma and advanced diploma courses his former responsibilities include being member of curriculum committee being member public relations officer and public information officer university of kerala and being nss program officer nat coordinator iqac coordinator and so on his 
current responsibilities include being chapter head and special invitee, executive committee of LTI, member for English Board of Studies, master trainer in the Access Micro Scholarship Program of the Regional English Language Office, New Delhi, and liaising the exchange program of the Canterbury Christ Church, Kent, UK, with various centers of higher education in Kerala. Dr. Lal has paid numerous academic visits abroad and holds membership in various editorial boards and has also organized a number of seminars and workshops. He has been bestowed with Salute the Silent Worker Award in 2015 and Eltai Hornby Trust Award for use of ICT in education. He has edited and also written quite a number of English course books and has presented and published many papers in national and international conferences and journals. He is a PhD guide to a number of scholars and has been a resource person for many workshops, seminars and conferences at regional, national and international levels. It is a blessing that you are here with us today, sir. We are really inspired and hope to learn a lot from you that would help us go places in our career. May the Lord Almighty bless you with more and more laurels in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Sandrashana, madam. Sandrashana, madam. Harshini, madam, you can tell us about the story of the story. Sandrashan, madam. Yes, sir. Now, Dr. Lyle, Harshini, ma'am, has introduced you. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, we are privileged to have Dr. Lyle in our midst. Sir, I am each Dr. Lal to take the mic. Yes, thank you. Um, before I start uh, the presentation and turn on the present now button, uh, I have a request to the participant. Please turn off your uh, video and your mic, and better not touch the mouse at all until the, the questions time comes. You'll be tempted to click something, and that might cause problem. So my advice is turn off your video so that bandwidth will be uh, more available for the audio. Thank you. And also not to do anything else on the screen while the talk is going on so that we won't have disturbances. Thank you very much for that. So let me try to turn on my uh, screen for you. Um, I'm, uh, is my screen visible to you? I hope it is. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes sir. Okay, good. Well, it is um, in PowerPoint team. Well, uh, right. Okay, the topic we have is uh, according. Well, let me let me first of all thank uh, Dr. Chandrasena and registrar and all the authorities of the MGR University for inviting me for this talk today. And uh, I am no stranger to MGR University. I've been to the university a couple of, time, a couple of times, once to uh, take part in my conference and another time to do a PhD. So uh, this, is, this is like coming back to the university again uh, during these uh, times of lockdown. So the um, and I understand that this is a session in which the teachers are preparing for the next uh, semester, uh, whenever that is going to happen. And um, I have planned my talk accordingly. Um, well, uh, it, uh, it would be nice if you could interact, but uh, given the limitation of the present medium, we can't do that. But I'll assume that you will do a bit of interaction at least and, and some parts. Let us go ahead with that. The topic uh, we have uh, 
and I have uh, planned this reappraising teaching techniques for ESL classes. So we are all teachers and we have been teaching for quite a number of years. So there is no particular point in teaching uh, new things. There aren't many new things for us to learn either because we are experienced. And but uh, so I'll do a kind of reappraisal of certain aspects uh, of English for second language teaching uh, <clears throat> from uh, from very from a very practical context. So as a new uh, year or a new semester begins, we think of our classes again. Not that we don't think of our classes otherwise. So uh, first, I thought I'll start talking uh, with the, uh, the notion of lesson planning. When uh, people do training programs, and in some colleges, the authorities insist on having written lesson plans, which is all good. I have no particular things to say about that. But I would go a step beyond that and think of lesson planning as a part of our essential uh, preparation for teaching. So uh, some, you know, however you plan, however good a teacher you are, and however excellent our students are, and however wonderful our facilities, there can be very good days and there can be very bad days. I, I do not mean rainy days or very hot days. I mean, you plan very well and you go to a class and you find that none of your tricks work on that particular day. And some days you don't plan that much and you are very, uh, you are rather off your mood and all that, but still you find that your classes work exceptionally well. This is an experience that every teacher has gone through. So that, that shows that we are, we are different from other people working in this other fields. In another area, if you plan well, you know exactly how you are trajectory is going to be, how exactly the things will go. But in a classroom, that's not the case, particularly because we are working with living, uh, very dynamic human beings. And uh, it, it has there is a different kind of combination in each class. And the dynamics of the class will vary according to that. M many uh, umpteen different aspects. So we can never really anticipate how our class is going to be, particularly in this context of autonomy. Well, uh, maybe 30 years or 40 years back, it was okay. If you plan a lecture well, you go deliver your lecture and come back, it's fine. It's not the teacher's worry whether the students understood or they, they were listening, etc. We kind of had the teacher-centered model of classes then. But now, the last one decade, two decades, we have gone a long way to uh, giving our learners autonomy. Largely, they have become autonomous now, but still we have a quite a long way to go. Um, so particularly with autonomous learners, with their, their needs and their priorities given a lot of importance, our class can never be anticipated. So planning a lesson, planning a class, by lesson I mean a, a session that you do, one hour or 45 minutes. So planning a lesson will certainly increase the chances of it being a successful one, a general statement. And I, um, I quote Jim Scribner, who is a writer I respect quite a lot. Uh, here is a book uh, by Scribner that uh, you might find useful. Uh, it's called Learning Teaching, Essential Guide to English Language oh. Teaching. That is Jim Scribner. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he is a wonderful teacher himself. I had the privilege. Prabha Naveen, sir. Excuse me, sir. Prabha Naveen, yes. sir, can we stop presenting? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Sir. Can I go on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So well, to you have quote, to present the screen again, sir, because uh, oh, it has gone. Sorry. Yes, sir. Let me see. Uh, that's because of the participant presenting, sir. No problem. Yeah, I, I, I once again request the participants don't touch the screen, please. Don't touch your mouse. Yes, sir. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So I was about to quote Jim Scribner. Uh, Scribner says, uh, planning is also a thinking skill, which made me think a lot. We always think of planning as something that we write down very tediously because somebody asked us to do that. But for a teacher who on whom uh, a formal lesson, lesson plan is not a compulsion, 
even uh, planning becomes a thinking skill. It's part of our thinking process. When we plan our class, that is when we think of our class, we start planning. And planning is part of the thinking process. Well, uh, but the uh, written plan, if you have, it shows that you have been thinking. And uh, that's not always needed for a teacher. For an experienced teacher, or even an inexperienced teacher, that it is possible to have the plan in your head. You don't have to write it down in great detail. But it is good to have written practice and written writing lesson plans and also in revising it because that will update you in terms of the requirements of the learners and things like that. So having the plan in your head is very important. Well, this, these are, this is by way of opening the conversation. Now I have uh, for you a little paragraph which I'd like you to read quickly. It has a couple of, a couple of statements that are not true. So I'd like you to uh, keep in your mind, which are not true. Here I am imagining you to be students. This is a task perhaps I would give to my students when I begin a class with a particular item in mind. So here, for example, I have a grammatical item in mind and I am trying to present it to the class. So I request your attention to this slide where I have written a paragraph in which there are a couple of things that are not true. I am I'm lying there. Please read, take 30 seconds for that. So this is uh, my account about lockdown. So I've said that lockdown days are indeed special. I find these days just great and have attended a few parties. The police force is very vigilant and would not allow people to go out unnecessarily. The tigers in the zoo have, city zoo have been roaming free to ensure peace. Most people remain indoors, reading books or fighting with family as usual. <laughs> I shave every day and have even dyed my beard. So that is a, um, a, a paragraph with both facts and fibs in it. So this is something I have uh, for you. And on, in the second stage, I have highlighted the sentences which are not true. I'm sure you guessed because it's very evident. Uh, I find these days just great and have attended a few parties. It's not possible. The cities in those, the tigers in the cities who have been roaming free to ensure peace. Well, you know, I shave every day and have even dyed my beard. You look at my face and you know it's a lie. So these are three statements in the sentence which are not true but it is uh, very uh, it is contextual for us because it's related to the teacher who is talking it is contextual to us because it is about a condition that we all of us are going through so in the third stage i draw your attention just to three uh, parts of the whole uh, unit have attended have been roaming and have even died so I have zeroed in on three grammatical items which involve the present perfect form. Well, now let's go to the next slide, which is about how do students learn a new item? The new item I am trying to teach here is present perfect forms. Well, I'm not going to teach in detail at all. I'm just drawing your attention to a few aspects of teaching. So in our everyday class, uh, don't read it. Uh, I don't want you to be distracted by the stuff on the uh, PowerPoint. Just listen to me now. Um, we as teachers, uh, we teach literature. Uh, most many of us lead, 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 read, I mean, teach literature. But we have a big responsibility of teaching um, language to our learners, particularly learners in their beginning stage, you know, the initial stage, uh, maybe uh, throughout the undergrad period, they can be considered to be in the early part. And then slowly they will move to the higher levels of language learning. So we assume that uh, we present in the class an item. It can be a grammar item. It can be a pronunciation item. It can be a vocabulary item. Here I have taken a grammar item, which is which we saw, which was the present perfect 
uh, forms. But I, uh, I am not telling you that it is a present perfect. I just said, shared that with you because we are teachers. And I, I, I wanted you to know that. But in the class, I wouldn't mention these are present perfect tenses until much later. If at all, I would do that. Well, um, there are a few stages through which a learner learn a learner learns a new item, or rather, the teacher teaches a new item in the class. The first stage is ignorance or near ignorance. Forgive that expression; it sounds rather negative, but it just means that students so that student is not aware of a particular item. It's not that he is living in darkness in great ignorance. He is ignorant about a particular aspect, and it is that aspect that I am trying to focus on. So the progression is from that to six, which we'll read one by one. Read along with me. Don't read ahead of me. There is no particular point. We are not in a competition here. The learner doesn't know anything about the item. So the item here, we know it is perfect forms. The second stage is exposure. The learners, learner hears or reads examples of the item, maybe a number of times, but doesn't particularly notice it. We did that here. We, we read this form within a context. We, we, we are teachers. We are we are advanced. Uh, we have advanced knowledge in English. So we just looked at it for 30 seconds. But maybe we'll allow our learners to look at it more, we allow them to read it a couple of times. So that is the first stage where we have this exposure to learning. And then the second, third is noticing. The learner begins to realize that there is a feature he doesn't fully understand, not always, or a feature that he needs to know more about. So let me add that to that statement. A learner realizes there's a feature he needs to know more about. OK, so that is where this noticing happens. OK, so that is what happened in the second stage, that there, are, there is something problematic about these sentences. They are untrue. That is why only the, un the fibs statements, the untrue statements have these features. So that, that is to draw their attention to that. Slight planning uh, on the part of the teacher, where they notice that there is a feature in these sentences which are not there. And this is not a conscious pro process, let me tell you. So you don't have to tell them to notice anything at all. Teacher do not have to tell them to notice. This exposure, noticing, are things that should happen automatically. And how you create that in the class depends on your ingenuity and your uh, you know, skill as a teacher. And the third stage is understanding, where the learner starts to look more closely at the item and tries to work out the formation rules and the meanings, possibly with the help of reference information, explanation, and other help. Here, it's a bit conscious process where you encourage them to look at that particular item. So it's a vocabulary item, it's a pronunciation item, or like here, or a grammar item, we uh, allow them to focus more on those particular places where the item that we want them to learn is hidden. So that is where the understanding happens. Um, I'm just referring to these things uh, in a very general way. We need to work differently with different grammatical items in different classes. Well, in the fifth stage, the learner tries to use the item in his own speech or writing. Yeah, maybe hesitatingly or with errors. But in the fifth stage, how it is it should be done can be done by teachers in so many different ways. Where you take you you encourage the learner to go out beyond the the context. Um, is that a problem? No, no, no okay. sir, no sir. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, in the fifth stage, what we do is we travel further. For example, in this case, you can ask the students to create. Say, uh, for four sentences of their own, following the teacher's model about their own lives, which should have the same structure. Alternate sentences should be, should contain the same construction and should contain a mistake or something like that, which will give them practice. And it is the sixth stage, which is something that ha happens outside the classroom, where the learner integrates item fully into his or her uh, language and uses it without being conscious about it. Yeah. But still, there will be minor errors. That's a very important thing you should keep in mind. From the very beginning till the end, there is, our, our movement is not towards always towards perfection. 
There will be errors in all stages, but our aim is to make that item useful for the person who is learning it. It should remain, it should not remain in a domain separately, something that happens exclusively in the classroom. It should become the, 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 the learner's own so that he or she goes out and tries it out. So, well, well, I'm, I'm not giving any solutions. This is generally the progression of a, uh, how, a, uh, how a class will progress. And this is how we implement it depends on our uh, individual ways of teaching. And I would also say this is the process through which we learn even outside the classroom. Well, on a broader scale, where we talk about the, the extensive reading and extensive listening through reading books, through reading articles, through reading stories, or listening to stories, listening to music, etc., the students are being exposed. And it's noticing in this class, this is a class in, environment where we structured them, in, in, structured the uh, lesson in such a way that there is a case of noticing. But in actual life, we, we, we are not conscious about it. As the student is exposed to the language naturally through reading and listening, this noticing happens automatically, provided you give the orientation in the. Um, Sai Baba Gan Ganwar Pusa. Sir, I'm sorry that you have to present it again, sir, like Certainly. slide again. Certainly, sir. Sir, Sai Baba, uh, sir, please stop presenting. Yeah. Participants kindly do not present anything on the screen until the session gets over, please. Okay, uh, am I back? Yes. I, uh, yes. Yes, sir, uh, you, you are. Dear right. friends who have joined yes, uh, after we began, what we should do is please turn off your video, and uh, mic is automatically turned off, I believe, and don't touch the screen. Uh, don't touch your mouse. The mouse is dangerous. Keep it away and keep your hands like this or like this and sit and <laughs> concentrate because if you accidentally touch some button, the talk will be interrupted. All right, thank you for that. And I was talking about um, natural acquisition of language. Uh, do, and the two students can do without teachers. In learning language, students can manage without teachers. But I'm not saying that we are redundant. But the learning becomes much more enriching. We give them this structured practice of doing this. Not consciously, you're not going to tell them that, well, you're ignorant of this item and you're going to ex I'm going to expose you to it first and then you will notice. This is something the teacher keeps in the mind. This is entirely for the teacher to have in mind and structure the lesson plan accordingly or the lesson accordingly. And uh, I, we need to keep in mind that this is a process the student will also follow in real life uh, when he or she tries to learn language through being uh, exposed to uh, wide reading and wide listening. So it, they get exposed to so many structures. And at times, they notice some particular structure or particular idiom or particular um, you know, spelling. And while this, if it's listening, they will notice a particular accent or a pronunciation aspect. Noticing happens. If, they, if you can give them in this training in the class, they will do it better in real life. And then this understanding of the meaning, et cetera, happens. And the, the practice and active use part outside there, which, will, which we hope will happen in their real life, if provided they have the context, they will also come back to the class and uh, have it, uh, you know, give uh, expression to it while we give them some tasks to do. Well, this is the general plan we should have when we, our focus is on language uh, uh, learning. And if you, if, when we are teaching literature, we can also have this very same things in mind so that we extract both literary aspects and linguistic aspects from the text we are dealing. All right. Um, here, uh, I think the second aspect I'll talk about, the first aspect was on lesson planning. Second aspect is about teaching grammar, because we do a lot of grammar teaching. And uh, the, the point of what uh, grammar teaching is all about uh, is a very troubling question. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, Everything we do in the class is grammar related. So we need to remember that grammar is not just what, what is contained in the grammar book. Grammar is everything that we do in the class. Even pronouncing a sentence, giving the proper accent in a particular place is partly grammatical. Uh, 
So it's not just the structure. You say the right structure in the wrong way, you get your idea wrong. So that is the, so the, the grammar, I would mean in a very wide way, everything that helps your learner understand what you're saying, everything the learner uh, need to communicate with his uh, fellow, his or her uh, peers and out in the job environment, everything he needs related to with language would be grammatical needs. Um, so, but, you know, we use grammar in this restricted way in the, in the, in the sense of the, how the words are arranged, the structure, the syntax of the sentences, the structural things, what we usually uh, categorize under grammar. So you have the, we have these three aspects of grammar, which we need to keep in mind. The form, which is the uh, present perfect, for example, we discussed that. The form, the way in which the words appear to our eyes before the cognition happens. And there is a meaning, of course, certainly. What, what meaning we get is also a very important thing. But we generally neglect this aspect. Mostly in the traditional uh, classes and even in today's classes, we, because we are inundated by so many other responsibilities and so many other work priorities, we often focus more on form and meaning. We say this is a form and this is what it means, is what we also do. We assume that the learner acquires the uh, use or function. The learner learns how to use it in context and uh, learns the function of it later on their own. That is our assumption. We do this form and meaning in the class and assume that this big chunk happens in the, in the lives of the students, which need not always happen. So then how do we structure our class, grammar class? Uh, this pop is a, a fond uh, word I'm using to refer to my father, uh, who passed away last November. He was a teacher. Uh, he lived a rich life uh, as a teacher. And he would share with me this experience of teaching grammar. Uh, when He was primarily an economics teacher. But when he was a young uh, person, he used to te teach some uh, poor people in the neighborhood how to use English because he had an interest in English. So I'm sharing his grammar adventure with you. Well, look at this. What he did was this was long back, even before I was born. Uh, that that yeah. Um, um, so he is everything okay? Hello. Okay, so um, is that a problem? Okay, okay, it looks okay. Anyway, thank you. So uh, I'm coming back to my father's grammar class. So he tells, he would share this experience of the presenting the form noun plus is plus verb plus ing. Uh, this is a present continuous form, and he would first say, this is how the... So th what he would do is he would say, I'm going to teach you the present continuous form today. Students, dear students, today we are doing the present continuous form in English. And then he would give examples. My sister is singing, Gobal's son is walking, and so many examples he would give. And he would give people exercise after that. They, you know... And one exam exercise he gave was Rama's wife is dash. And he wanted the students to uh, you know, complete that sentence with a suitable verb. And this is the answer one very ingenuous lady wrote. Rama's sir, wife is dash. Sir, sir yes. your presentation is not uh, visible, sir. Your BPD is not visible, sir. Brilliant. I will come back and do that. Wait a minute. OK, sir. Thank you, Mr. It's okay. I hope I have come back. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. We are very dynamic listeners. They sometimes present on their own. Anyway, so I was saying that uh, my father was teaching English long back, and he gave the students this form, noun is plus verb plus ing, and then he would give examples. And then he gave, when he gave this exercise, asked them to say what Rama's wife is dash. 
he expected them to say rama's wife is uh, walking rama's wife is singing rama's wife is cooking etc but the answer the student one of the students wrote was rama's wife is seething so she knew rama's wife was seetha and uh, because after his uh, ing should come so noun e plus is plus verb plus ing so she created this little nice verb and put an ing after that well that was the result of this model of teaching well of course this method of teaching worked with so many people but there were occasions when it failed and this is an occasion when it did not work a proverbial occasion so what uh, he was trying to do is he presented the form first and he gave some practice to the students and he hoped that it will the students will use it in the class this is what traditionally we have been doing we would present the form we would give them practice in the class and then we'll assume that it has become theirs that they will use it which very often did not happen that it still continues to be a problem in our classes when we we present we give them practice and but we assume that is use part using that construction or that particular language feature in real life we hope will happen on its own sometime later but very often it doesn't happen now imagine you are teaching a grammar um, item and your your thought should be after the students leave the class will they be able to recognize it when they meet it means the grammar item while listening or reading will they be able to form the item in isolation including stress intonation etc will they be able to use it to express some meanings in short has that grammar item become their own this is a question we need to ask ourselves when we plan a language class and particularly a grammar class so this is the old model which ended in rama's wife is seething which is a presentation practice and the assumed use and the this is a different model where we uh, what we did before we we you read the passage first you used your linguistic knowledge first and then you had a practice of it when this or rather you did not have but the student later on did a practice where they wrote their own sentences and later at the end in another day if you want the teacher can tell them what we did in the last class was to learn the present perfect form so this is just the opposite of the old model the problem is when you tell them you are going to say do the present perfect tense in the when the very beginning of the class uh, my experience is and the experience of most teachers will be that they students will be slightly frightened by these terms and and even very intelligent students who are capable of designing a rocket will complain that english is difficult it's probably so because primarily because we have always told them uh, these difficult terminology terms like present perfect continuous etc uh, are basically are meant for teachers to keep in their minds and encourage the learners to uh, you know make it their own they should the learner should be able to use a present perfect construction but he need not necessarily know it is a present perfect construction only those students who later on plan to become english teachers on their own need to have that knowledge but sometimes the exp the expressions like present or past or tense etc will be very useful in the class but that can happen a little later in our class so this is a, a something we need to deal in great detail but just briefly i am touching on that aspect and third uh, thing we discussed today would be the use of language one in the class so how much mother tongue would we use in the class how much tamil can be used or how much hindi can be used or malayalam kannada can be used in the class when we are teaching english to the students there can be two extremes there can be too much of mother uh, language one and too little of language one uh, and I, so what happens when there is too much of uh, mother mother tongue i have written here that human nature is not to do anything that is not necessary none of us would do anything use our brain or use our muscles unless we have full conviction why we should do that so you read an english sentence to the students and then you explain the whole thing in uh, in your mother tongue what happens is, is the students will listen most of the students will listen only to the uh, the translated part they will their brain will switch 
they it will go into a hibernation mode when you're reading the english and they will become alert uh, when you read the uh, the mother tongue part that, that is because we are structured like that we won't do anything unless there is a need for it so but this is not about all the students in the class but a good number of students in the class this is a challenge that we always have so the question is how much uh, can we use mother tongue in the class it's a very serious question um there need to be a balance that's the idea not too much of language one and not too little of language one if you totally take language one out of the class also we can have a problem let's look at this language one use mother tongue use is to be judiciously done we generally tolerate language one use so when the teacher is teaching and the teacher's idea is that so you the teacher has decided not to use mother tongue in the class or minimally use mother tongue in the class and the teacher is using only english consistently but then she or he finds a lot of students using mother tongue we will generally tolerate that we won't impose english on them at that stage but yeah even the teacher can use the mother tongue when it is needed because uh, another important thing is we are working with as i said brains which are which has a strong emotional part human beings are very emotive and very often we assume that they are only uh, you know ra highly rational creature that's not so our learners come into a class with many many yes, so sorry for the interruption ah, please yes. stop presenting yeah, on the screen I'll, please I'll do that. stop I'll do that. it has become oh. a way in life okay now yes sir uh, so participants please do not present anything on the screen it uh, maheshwaran sir please stop presenting again it has happened again uh, yes sir now we, now it is clear i think everybody can uh, see your ppt all right okay yeah so to tell to join us later you, please turn off your videos turn off your mics and don't touch your mouse on you don't it has gone again no sir now it is very clear sir no no it is not visible sir sir it is not visible sir okay no, okay dear dear please don't yeah please don't yeah. touch the yeah. mouse dear participant here now sir please don't touch your mouse just watch look at the screen silently and bear with me till i finish daud sir can you centrally switch off the mic please yes sir can you can am i visible now just one minute sir one minute yes uh category man now is it visible <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's very nice. To, this is the way in which we express that we are here, which is a nice thing. So, uh, so that the whole thing won't become too mechanical. Anyway, let's go back to what I was saying. thank you so i was saying that um, we, the teach, even the teacher can resort to language one mother tongue because uh, as i was saying our students are you know have a strong emotional aspect to them and sometimes using a little bit of mother tongue in the class will work magic they will feel motivated or they 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 will feel more connection with the teacher this is something i have felt very often even while doing pg classes when we continuously go on in english there is a disconnect between the teacher and the students at times which which we need to be resolved anyway so uh, but even though we tolerate uh, mother tongue in the class every, in every class we can have maybe five or 10 minutes a program uh, some activity we do participants can you please turn off your mic <coughs> Hello.
Mr. Balaji, can you please stop presenting? Yes. I think now I am visible again. Uh, now the, uh, I think now we can see your presentation, sir. There is yes. no interruption. Please try to mute all the participants. Yes, sir. I'm, do I'm doing it, sir. I'm doing it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I feel at home because I can hear a baby crying. Nice second. I'm not crying. One talking. minute, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Shall I go on? Yes, sir. <laughs> A nice friend has come on screen now. Oh. I'll try to remove, sir. I'll try to remove. I'm just, sir. Uh, it's okay. It's difficult to find out because there are 200 participants, so it is very difficult to find out. I know. Shall I yes, resume sir. my yes, presentation? Sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we'll go to the next um, aspect, which is related to correcting errors. Well, a major issue that we have in the class. Um, a couple of points we need to remember is errors are not always bad. Um, you know, we have a strong animosity towards errors, uh, and we also do not like if our errors are corrected. So we must remember that uh, two things. One is errors are not always bad. They are positive signs of growth. It shows that the person is trying to learn. A child who's, you know, uh, who's very small will try to stand up and walk, and then it will inevitably fall. Nobody just jumps up, springs up one fine morning and walks straight out of the room. You fall, you crawl, you, you know, you, you are in all kinds of miserable states before you actually start walking uh, firmly on the ground. In the same way, when we learn language, we do make an immense lot of errors, which is a positive sign that you are doing it. A child that is lying down all the time, it's not positive. Many many parents have this worry. They say, why, why, why is my child always falling down? It's falling down because it's a normal, healthy baby. In the same way, our students make mistakes because they are normal, healthy individuals and because they are trying to learn. So all. One point is that errors are not always bad. Of course, making errors persistently is certainly problematic. I'm not talking about that. Having difficulties in your language is an inevitable process of language development. It's applicable to us too. And all errors need not be corrected all the time. That's another aspect. We have another, as teachers, we feel that the students should, should come up only with the correct sentences. If they make a mistake, you are terribly alarmed. You don't have to be alarmed. Let them make mistakes. All errors need not be corrected all the time. If you if you are you know if you do an activity in the class and the student speaks and he makes a mistake and he tries to correct you try to correct him, it'll impede his fluency. It'll it'll inhibit him. He he won't feel like speaking spontaneously the next time. So all errors need not be corrected all the time, uh, because correction should not be at the cost of fluency and self-esteem. Two important things. A student tries to speak and he speaks in a clumsy language, you just allow him to speak. And you just have this culture in the class where the others, others also learn to respect this learning process where you make mistakes in all aspects, in, in pronunciation, in spelling, etc. And you don't correct all the time. And correcting is a major thing. When you, if you, when you correct, when you scold, when you give impositions, etc., you are challenging the self-esteem of the learner. I'm not talking about persistent arbitrary mistakes. I'm talking about natural errors that happen in the class, which we uh, frown upon generally. Correction should not be at the cost of fluency, and it should not impede the self-esteem of the learner. And uh, the teacher can effect correction in the class without personalizing. So when a person is talking, you keep quiet, and, and you note that error, and you later, through a little activity or through a uh, in, in a statement that, well, let me uh, look at this particular aspect. I've often heard people do it this way, etc. Without pinpointing the person, you can make uh, these corrections. 
what I meant by personal correction is if there is a student in the class who persistently make a mistake, you can talk to him or her personally and take, uh, discuss the issue with him. That is also a possibility of the, that. Is, then he won't feel challenged. When you correct before the peers, very often they feel humiliated. Um, well, and, and in the, at the end of every class, you can have a discussion where of the most persistent errors. That's a way of correcting mistakes. So very often we feel that oh, there's this ocean of errors in the class. And what, do, what am I going to do about it? You, you cannot do anything about it. It's not the teacher's business to correct all the mistakes that the students are ever going to make. You may be able to support with them with a few. So at, at the end of your well-planned class, take spare 10 minutes, perhaps if possible, to discuss one or two issues that you notice. It can be related to pronunciation. It can be related to grammar. Discuss uh, one or two issues and uh, and give them some work based on that. That's the way you uh, you move slowly from fluency to accuracy. Another aspect uh, we are uh, coming towards the uh, final part. Um, learning styles and learner differences is one thing we need to keep in mind. As I said, we are our our classrooms are very dynamic. They keep changing because we have autonomous learners. And when we move towards autonomy of learners, we need to consider learning styles and learner differences very seriously. Uh, each student has a you know, can have a different learning style from the teacher style and from the style of the others. Close, it's the, the learning style and is closely related to the personality of the learners. Each learner is unique. And each learner is different in the way he or she perceives and constructs the world. We have a different way in which we, we understand the world. And in the same way, we have a different way in which we learn also. I learn uh, about the world by seeing, and I am a visual learner. I am more, I am more able to listen to the sounds of my surroundings and understand I am more, uh, my auditory uh, system is stronger. You have different ways in which you learn. And your learners also will be different in that way. And you need to structure your class accordingly. So depending on the individual styles of understanding, we need to structure our class. Teaching strategies should be framed to suit this variety uh, among the learner, learning styles. Well, this is, again, another topic. What I'm doing today is kind of discuss different or those aspects which I thought are very important uh, when you start your classes afresh. And here is a little checklist uh, for teachers who are planning to do a language class. Uh, you know, there are different kinds of intelligences, as we often have heard. Uh, and this is a checklist. We, when you plan a lesson, whether it's a written plan or a plan that you have in your mind, see that you have addressed linguistically intelligent students by including reading, speaking, writing, spelling activities and games in your class. Games do not mean students running about all the time. It can be a five minute puzzle solving or a jigsaw um, or, a, or a you know crossword doing or something like that. It, it is optional. You don't have, don't have to have games in the class. You can, it's good, but you need not always have it. Uh, just like students are of different nature, we are also of different nature. Every teacher cannot be a performer. Every teacher cannot be dynamic, springing around and all that. So according to your, but we can always move to uh, away from our pattern and change a bit. But at the same time, sometimes you may not have the skill to conduct a, a, a game in the class. Don't, don't do it. It's not necessary. If you can, certainly have games in the class. Well, um, and many of our learners are highly logical in their learning. They like things to be in a in a, to have a pattern to be in the form of uh, tables in, in well structured formula -like form etc so you need to keep them in mind have you included grammar practice problem solving tasks logic puzzles calculations critical thinking activities don't don't worry about these things but i just want to draw your attention towards that and there are very visual learners who would include you know who would like colors who would like graphics images so you need to include visuals, colors, pictures, etc., for them. And bodily kinesthetic, I, as I was saying, some, some teachers are very bodily kinesthetic. They can dance and they can move around the class dynamically. But everybody cannot do that. 
And so the just as there are different kind of learners, there are different kind of teachers. And but we can we can learn a bit from our colleagues. Uh, very often you feel that a particular colleague is doing things differently. Don't worry about it. That is he or she has a special kind of intelligence. And yours is different. You have your own strengths. But at the same time, you can pick some cues from the other persons and try to do that a bit. Develop your your skill in uh, doing something else. Uh, well, uh, bodily kinesthetic learners who like to have action in the class. So role plays and stuff like that will help them a lot. Role plays and uh, group activity should become part of our class, which I think already has become anyway. Uh, I leave this musical part. Uh, well, and uh, this, these two are very important, intrapersonal and interpersonal things. Some students are highly introverted and they work best when they are alone. So give them you know, see that you have some work for them, private learning time, self relax, you know, self relaxation, learning diaries. There will be a handful of students who are highly introverted in the class who always tend to suffer in the class because you feel that they are too arrogant or too proud. But actually, that need not be the case. It's just that the person is a bit shy deep within, very lonely kind of individual who has great potential in him or her, who would need special attention. You don't mock them in the class, but give special care to them, additional duties, etc. And there are many with high interpersonal skill who can, you know, interact with others who, who, are, who are not at all shy, who are very communicative, etc. So you need to keep them also in mind. So we, your class will have all these kinds of things and your lesson plan need to have all these things in mind too. Well, I think that is uh, pretty much that I have to discuss with you before we talk, before I conclude and request questions. I conclude saying it's important to bear in mind that there are many different ways of learning. And there are many different ways of teaching. And that many would resist any attempt to change their preferred learning style. Students would, wouldn't want uh, to change their learning style. A style that they have formed in, in school, they may live with through their life. So you need to respect that. And, and we also have the same problem. We may have a learning style which we, we may try to impose on our students, which again is a very dangerous thing because your student is not you. And we uh, need to keep that in mind uh, very much. The whole area of learner difference is rather complex and can be quite perplexing even to experienced learners. So the, this is only a tip of the iceberg. The problems that teachers confront every day in the classroom is of a wide range and it's very complex, including the aspects related to learner difference. We need to be well informed about the strengths and limitations of the models we are using and adapt them judiciously. Models of lessons in the classroom. When you plan your lesson, keep all these things in mind, we do constantly learn. You know, I, at no point will a teacher be able to say, I've learned everything. Now I can uh, easily do a lesson. That will never come. Even uh, however old you get, the, 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 the students are also changing. The times are changing. And you need to shift your ways accordingly. So that is pretty much uh, I, um, all that I have in mind. And because the time is also a little uh, uh, ahead then, uh, we planned. I would like to thank you for your kind attention and, um, you know, sorry we couldn't inter interact more, but perhaps now we'll have a few questions. Thank you. Uh, now it's Q&A session. Uh, please one by one mute your mic and ask your queries and questions. Um. Sir, we would like to have the last uh, slide that you are showing. Uh, please, sir. Yeah. If you don't mind. I will do that. I'll do that. Which I missed. The last you slide mean? that you have this the picture there. Uh, yeah, this, yes. Uh, this? Uh, yes. The last one. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, after that. After that, you should hold. Oh, this one. Uh, which I did uh, not talk yes, about. Sir. You like me to I this? want you to. <laughs> Oh, great, great. I, I thought uh, I was trying to save the time. Well, ha happy to do it. Well, this is the whole process. Here you have input, which is what we give the learners in the class, and also what we expect the learners to do outside the classroom through extensive reading and listening. And learning is something that hap we assume will happen in between through understanding, through memorizing, reflection, noticing, etc. And finally, you have the use part. This is the largely under 
um, what shall we say, uh, the part that we don't give much attention to. We need to focus on this a lot because unless we do that, our input and this central part will have little impact. That is, that is basically what this image is trying to tell you. So what we do in the class is uh, two kinds of exposure. One is restricted exposure. Just like I gave a passage in the beginning, that is restricted exposure. For It, it can be for reading or listening. And this authentic exposure is what the students actually read outside the classroom, uh, which is, we, we can also do that. You're giving them newspaper articles to read the authentic exposure. The language that they will encounter in real life is authentic exposure. The rest of the exposure is the language models that we create for them in the form of a textbook or the teacher developed content. And there is also other data, postbook information, teacher explanations, doubts that we get cleared, reference books, etc. And all these things help in noticing. If noticing doesn't happen, the language learning process will not be very rewarding. Very often we have a problem with this because we are worried more about structuring our lesson. We are worried about the input aspect. Sometimes we, we are not sure whether the students do this noticing. Only if they notice will they be able to use it. And this is, uh, this, uh, this is about output. We expect them to notice and then to use uh, I, what I was repeatedly talking about, the you aspect, which is using, where the students use. And using also can have a restricted mode and an authentic mode. In the restricted mode is what we do in the classroom, where you ask a person to stand up and speak or to discuss in group or uh, to submit a written assignment is the restricted output where they will use a limited number of vocabulary items. They don't have much choice in doing it. In the authentic output, they have a lot of choice to experiment and to uh, and to use a wider range of uh, skills that they have learned. So that is th this is actually a summing up of what I um, have put in the presentation throughout. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, sir. And I thank the uh, MGR University for having given us a chance to listen to you, sir. My question here is, how yes. do we apply Bloom's taxonomy, that is, all the six levels, while teaching grammar to our students? Can you please repeat, sir? What uh, can we, how can we apply Bloom's taxonomy, ah. that is, all the six levels, yes. while teaching grammar to our students, sir? Well, I would say that Bloom's taxonomy uh, and all the theoretical things are part of what is called teacher's grammar. Those are uh, techniques, information that we conceive. This is one point I was also saying. We are so much worried about the theory that we learn that we are finding it difficult to actually help out our learners. There is, may, there is nothing wrong even in unlearning a bit. You know, group taxonomy gives you the information of how cognition works, how the learning happens in an intellectual plane, which is excellent for a teacher to know it. But in the actual class, through the practical things I was just saying, what you do is you are working out Bloom's taxonomy, you are working out all the theoretical information we have, conceivism, everything about how learning can be done in a learner-centered manner in without you know, um, making the learner too much conscious about this learning process. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Any more questions? Good afternoon, sir. This is uh, Karthi from Dr. Enkma University. Hello, Kathy. Kathini. Yes, sir. Um, so we have uh, in a class we have different uh, levels of students. Yes. And uh, how do we handle them? Like we have slow learners and we have uh, a different level of learners in the class. So how do we tackle that when we have a huge number of sixty in a class? How do we handle? How do we focus on slow learners? Well, that, that is a million-dollar question you're asking. How to manage large and multi-level classes? There are books on that. But none of these books have come up with any solid solution to how to manage a large and multi-level classroom. But uh, in fact, that was my focus too. In, even in a large classroom with multi-level uh, learners, uh, a couple of tips would be if you manage to get them motivated enough, there will always be a few uh, more students who are very difficult to motivate. We can put them in 
groups and get them to work. Even in a large class of 60 to 20, you can have group and pair activities, one thing, where they get closer experience with language, one-to-one -one talking. Another thing is that if they're very, uh, if uh, you should, I have tried this with limited success where we, uh, the, um, we bring about a mentoring system where we club uh, weak students with students who are better in their English. But the problem is that the students with better English need not have the, have the maturity to treat the, uh, the, the students with limited uh, ex uh, knowledge. So what you need to do is uh, put responsible students in charge of the weaker students. And that might work. It, it all depends on the time you devote on planning your class and working on your class. You, uh, it, it's all up to the teacher to find out where exactly this kind of intervention is needed. Anyway, it's, I'm not uh, trying to give a big explanation to your question because your question is a very big, uh, uh, it has raised a big issue which needs to be discussed a lot. And uh, and I have, uh, for the last 10, 15 years, I have tried to you know, write about it, read about it. And I found that pretty much much of the books on it have been written by people from abroad. There are books written uh, by people from England. And to them, large classroom is only a classroom with about 20 students. So their small classroom is a class with five or six students. To us, that is different. We are, we, we are like, compared to their notion, it is like having a convention in the class, 100 students. But that is our reality, and that is a reality which is not going to go away. However, we clamor for a smaller number of classrooms. It's not going to happen. So it's up to us uh, to develop strategies to manage large classes and also multi-level classes where we can have all kinds of levels. In your lesson plan, you should have a little bit for all these different learners. That is what I was trying to say in that learner difference part also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, this is Shuganti from Madras University. Ah, uh, hello. My question is, how can we improve the language skill of government school children, in, especially in rural areas, sir? Mm, if, you're, if all the students are equally low in their grades, uh, what you're, the problem you are talking is you have a syllabus meant for a higher level of learners. And you have a set of students who, who are not who, who are not even very sure of their letters of alphabet. That that's a very common problem we have. So what we need in the government school, one advantage is that they don't worry much about the performance in the final exam. So yeah. what? Oh, yeah, is there anything yeah. to say? Yeah, of course, sir. Hmm. Yeah. So one big blessing that that's the, actually a blessing. What you can do is don't try to, uh, you know, the suppose the learner's level is somewhere. Uh, in, in, in level four, uh, in a band of uh, 10. And your lesson is supposed to be for band six level people. And your students are only level four. That, that is a perpetual problem we have. I would say you bring it down to their level and do it only in that level. The, the, those aspects which are cognitively challenging for them, we, we, you can leave out. You, you can leave out because you're not doing any disservice. The syllabus you have is a standard kind of thing. It's created keeping in mind the average uh, situation. But very often we are put in at a very lower level uh, circumstance where this will not work. So where the teacher has the freedom to adapt it to their level, at least you will be able to do something. Suppose you are trying to implement the, the higher level to them, they will just learn it by heart and no language learning will actually happen. Thank you, sir. And sir, that, that differentiated learning can work with this kind of children, sir. Certainly, ma'am. Yes, yes. yes, yes. That is, uh, yeah. Reducing or diluting the, supposing the higher proficiency students are doing 10 exercises, these students can be given five like that. Uh, can it be useful for us, sir? Or sure, ma'am. In, in a class of multi level learners, we can do that. But the uh -huh. former lady was talking about the whole class being much below the level of the syllabus that we need to transact. Okay. Yes. Mm. Well, uh, all these things are our area for we to do further research on. Yes, sir. Sir, good afternoon, sir. I am Shaktivel from Paimatur. Hello, sir. Uh, hello. Sir, good afternoon, sir. This is Shaktivel. Yes, sir. Yes, tell me. 
Uh, sir, I have a question that the students are those who are really good at uh, uh, speaking skills, mm. uh, but uh, it is also very clear that uh, they don't have much efficiency in writing skills. Yes. It is very clearly evident nowadays because mm. they are really good at speaking and they assume themselves that they are really good at uh, uh, possessing all the four skills equally LS or W. Yes. But it is clearly evident that their writing skills are not good at uh, but when we uh, try to give uh, much attention on improving the writing skills, mm -hmm. they don't show much interest on uh, developing their writing skills because, uh, okay. as stated, their spoken skills are very much enough in uh, taking the placements. Mm -hmm. Oh. Then how shall we rectify this problem, problem and how shall the sir. writing skills uh, particularly be improved? Yes. Well, this is actually the counter, the opposite of the the common scenario where people are reasonably good at writing, but they have problem with speaking. So in a way, it is a good thing that they speak better because speech is a primary and difficult thing to attain. So um, I don't have a solution for that. Perhaps you could make it more attractive for them uh, to do more reading and also writing, uh, get them to read interesting stories, perhaps, and to give them more engaging uh, writing tasks, which is close to their situation. But it is not easy unless it is part of the curriculum. Students generally won't do it. So that, that is a regional solution you need to find for them. So I, as I was always saying, the students will never do anything. We will, we will not do either when we don't really have a purpose to do that. So we should we should find decide that this is that's a purpose and I have to do this. So if you you need to you'll probably need to create that in your case, make you know writing mandatory or something like that. Anyway, that's not, a, I'm not happy. Uh, so that we can. Uh, Hello, tell me. Uh, sir, uh, in that case that we can just create such a lab component mark so that uh, it will become a mandate for them to present their writing skills. Certainly. Will certainly, it be yeah, working out, sir? Yeah, and ensure that they do not copy it. Yes. Plagiarism. Sure, sir. Yeah. Sure, so the, what, sure. what you can you, do is, so uh, Shakti sir, one second. One thing so, is, yes, is when, yes. you give, when you give them big assignments, like writing several pages, the possibility of their just copying it is very high. So if you can True, give them sir. shorter chunks, larger mm -hmm. number in shorter chunks, that might work better with your learners. Sure, sir. Definitely, sir. Smaller, sustainable tasks. Okay. okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is uh, Dr. Rachna Yadav from DTU Hello. Delhi. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah, sir, uh, this question is there in my mind since long, and I guess you get the answer from this. I, I could get the answer from you that I used to yes. take personality development and soft skill with a student, but hmm. the, uh, the problem with the professional, especially the professional student, is that. If we are going to like, uh, we provide uh, them a space, a room. Okay, fine. Uh, you guys are free to ask anything. So they mm. take it for granted. You know, like, uh, okay, okay, now uh, the teacher is in our hand. So we mm. should be strict with them or we should be like that softer with them. Well, they start uh, crossing the yeah, boundaries. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> I understand. See, in learner autonomy, even uh, with our children at home, in, in, there was a time when they were not treated like human beings at all. Children were treated like lower class individuals. They did not have any voice. The child did not have the courage to ask the father anything directly. And such things were there. But now things have changed and, and children have absolute freedom and they can talk to the father directly, etc. It's the same in the class. There should be freedom, but the freedom should be a controlled kind of freedom. It's not anarchy in the class. It's a controlled kind of freedom where the, teach, the, the control is still with the teacher. Otherwise, the teacher is not needed. One major role of the teacher is certainly to control the class, scold them if necessary, take them to task, give them punishment, everything. I was saying not to punish them when they make a mistake in the class while doing an activity. Other behavioral issues you need to correct. But always we need to keep in mind that we should not hurt their uh, person, the emotive aspect. That is one thing we need to keep in mind. That is why teaching is a very challenging profession. And teaching language becomes even more challenging. As David Crystal 
the eminent linguist was saying, uh, in a neurosurgery is easy related to the job that we <laughs> teachers are doing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. But in the professionalism, Hello. definitely we have Hello. to face these kind of problems. Yes, yes. It's an everyday problem. So you need to have autonomy. Hello, sir. I and have... One second, sir. Can yes, I complete? Sir, until the, the person finishes. Yes. The next so we need to have autonomy, but at the same time, we should see that the discipline is not lost. The control has to be there. And young people are very tricky. They will, if they find you are, you are, you know, very liberal, they will try to exploit you. If that is in their <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So, hello, sir. Yes, hello. 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 Hi, sir. I am Dr. D.B. Rathor from Gujarat okay. Technological University. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. I'm, I can hear you. Yeah. So, I have a question. That yeah. Please. Hello. Yes, sir. But I can Generally see you. Student I mix up, you know, yeah. informal. And... Hmm. Yeah, I, a little bit uh, disturbance is there, sir. But you can go ahead. You're very Hello. Clear. You're very clear, sir. Just talk. Yeah, actually, sir, student uh, student is mixing up formal and informal languages when they write. So, what yes. is the solution of it? Generally, they speak. Uh, they write as they speak. Yes. Yes. Uh, I would say there is. it is a good thing that they write at all. If they mix gen, uh, informal expressions, it's, it shows that they are trying to use the language they have learned. Let them write, encourage them to write more and gently give them correction. But yeah. the written thing, you can always correct. That's the beauty of it, without hurting. You don't use a red pen, but with a red pen can say that, you know, you are incriminating them. But with a, uh, another color, you can yeah. underline and you can but you give comments. You need not correct all the things. You know, the important thing is to let encourage them to do it more. And these tend, these things tend to be corrected on their own without us worrying about it. So long as they keep trying, that's the biggest thing. Okay, but sir, exam, you know, exam like IELTS, TOEFL and all these things, it won't work in that way. Yes. So, uh. Well, uh, I would like to say one thing in this regard, sir. In the, in the class, in, in a class, we have uh, hundred, when you take in terms of percentage, there will be about 10 person who want to have very excellent command over language in I, uh, to do the IELTS or uh, so for that program. And they, they, unless they are highly motivated, they will not be able to do it. It's not our duty to prove, you know, you know to kind of uh, groom them to do an IELTS exam. Because to us, the majority of the learners with, with basic level issues are more important. So if we if you worry much about it, we'll be losing on uh, the fluency aspect. Well, another thing is, in, in the class, it's very important to encourage fluency, both in writing and reading. Let them do as much as they can. And the quantum is important. But ultimately, our move has to be towards attaining accuracy. As you said, the right kind of register that they use uh, to clear a, a test in English, etc. But um, well, it, it depends on us how we manage, how we keep the balance between uh, giving them in, enough uh, input in the class and encouraging them to write more, etc. It, it's again a tricky thing, but I think uh, we need not worry as long as the students are willing to do more reading and writing. Any, any more questions? Um, okay, one last question before we wind up. Yes. Sir, can we can we wind up, sir? Oh, we can. Yes, certainly. Or we can wait for one more question. Oh, I'm I'm okay for either. Okay, participants, if you have one more question, you can. I'm going I'm ma'am to be ready. Yes, ma'am, she is uh, in the line. I've already seen. I think she's ready, ma'am. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful, wonderful presentation, sir. And uh, taught us to improve our language. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I call Ms. Tangam, ma'am, to give all the thanks for the session. Yes. Tangam, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
can i proceed ma'am yes okay yes ma'am yes, okay. yes good afternoon one and all present here i on behalf of dr ngr educational and research institute university department of english would like to thank our eminent speaker dr c a lal professor of english university of kerala for his provocative session thank you sir i thank our joint registrar for his constant support i thank our head of the department and all faculties for organizing this national e level fdp thank you all i want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all participants present today thank you everybody once again thank you all thank you ma'am um, thank you sir that was an informative Hello. session thank you sir hello yes hello thank, thank you very much sir thank, thank you thank you for your information thank you sir sorry for thank you sir so wonderful and thought provoking session thank you so thank much you. thank you so much you welcome thank you so much sir yes sir there are a lot of uh, messages in the chat for you with all the yes, they, they are saying that it is informative <laughs> and good said we need the people, thank you sir kind a lot of messages sir a lot of messages yes sir for you sir and trying to read them hello uh, yes ma'am so thank you very much for your informative session sir wonderful session yeah. thank you sir thank you sir thank you okay Shall participants uh, you can yeah you can come back to uh, the next session by 2 o'clock you can join in by 150 at uh, 150 for uh, subaltern literature session